Good morning, everyone. Amen. Welcome to Bible Hour this morning. Amen. We're good. Talking about Jesus' passion and his resurrection, or this section is, 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 is entitled Jesus' Passion and His Resurrection. Um, last week, we ended with um, the religious leaders calling a, you could say, a legal trial um, for Jesus uh, because this happened um, during the night, and based on their laws, that was not supposed to happen. Um, and so they rushed to, uh, you know, make a decision and actually condemn Jesus um, to death. And so in order to legitimize this, this, this trial, they had to have another one um, in, in the morning or at daytime. And so they rushed um, to Pilate. In the eyes of these religious priests and teachers, Jesus was a very dangerous person and he had to be eliminated. As we dive into the scripture this morning, you will see that they, um, he, the charges that were brought against him was essentially for blasphemy, saying that he was God. That was, and as you will see that as he faced trial before Pilate, they're going to present some completely false accusation against him. Um, so, like I said, the, these Jewish people had already decided to Jesus' fate. They decided that he had to die because in their mind he had committed blasphemy. But they could not carry out the death penalty um, by themselves. They needed um, authority from the uh, Romans in order to do so. And so, essentially, he had to be tried in a quote-unquote Roman court in order for them to meet out capital punishments. So they took him to... Uh, the Roman governor of um, Judea, which Jerusalem was a part of, um, by the name whose name was Pilate. He Pilate typically resides in Caesarea, uh, but he was likely at Jerusalem um, to essentially keep the peace um, during this period because there's a lot of people that are gathered in Jerusalem for the Passover. So, the Jewish leaders essentially had arrested Jesus on theological ground, blasphemy. But they had to come up with some political reasons if they were to get him convicted by the Romans. And so the charges that, my apology here, the charges that was meted out to Jesus was essentially um, for someone committing rebellion as well as treason. So the, the first acquisition that they brought up is that they said that we found this fellow that talking about Jesus perverting the nation. That was the first charge that, that they brought up, that he was perverting the nation or, in other words, um, how should I put this? Um, you could say that he was leading them to, to ruin, um, but this was completely unfounded. If you think about the word perverting and its use here, essentially they were saying that he was trying to convert or persuade people to religious beliefs that they regarded as wrong or false. Um, and in fact, it was total opposite. I mean, Jesus was trying to uh, bring salvation to them. Amen. In fact, um, Jesus was trying to change the status quo. Amen. Because it wasn't working. Amen. I wanted to, to, to give hope. Amen. To give life to people. And, but in their minds, because they feel threatened, they said that Jesus was in fact doing the wrong thing religiously. The second accusation that they brought up against Jesus was a flat out lie. They said that he was forbidding people to pay taxes essentially. In fact, if you read that... Um, that um, interaction between Jesus and the religious leader, he actually said, give unto Caesar that which is due to Caesar. He actually took up a coin 
pretty much saying like pay taxes but give to God what is due unto God if you think about it Caesars were viewed as God so he's saying give him tax but don't treat him as God don't worship him right and so again just just a flat out lie in terms of what they were were accusing Jesus of the third one was that they said that he called himself a king which he did right um I I'll, I'll save that for later. Amen. We see Pilate here focused on the latter charges or latter charge because if he was claiming to be king, that could be construed as treason or grounds for a death sentence. Um, so he asks him specifically, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered and said, Thou say it. Yeah, you say it. It's as you're saying. Yes, it is as you, as you say. If you think about it, any other answer would be a lie, right? And we know that God cannot lie. right? So he, he answered him straight up. Um, but we know that his kingship was not a threat to Pilate or Caesar. Amen? His kingdom wasn't of this world. Amen? As this interaction happened, it became very clear that Pilate saw through the blatant lies of the religious leaders, and he, he, he figured out that they essentially wanted to get rid of Jesus because he was threatening the status quo. So he declared that, I don't find anything wrong with him. I find, I underline it in red here, he said to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. The accusation are false. He's not guilty. As the, the plans of these religious leaders began to unravel, they became desperate, fierce, the Bible says, and they came up with even more made-up charges. They claimed that Jesus was causing riots everywhere, starting in Galilee. You see how it's getting crazy? In order for them to get what they want, they had to lie. I have been in a, um, we, we have to be careful as children of God. Um, I, I have found myself, well, actually this wasn't me, where um, somebody in charge of a project that I was working on gave some instructions and when the folks carried it out and it didn't work, rather than taking ownership, he started blaming other people. Um, here's the deal. He was stepping up into a higher position and he asked me if I, was, if I wanted to um, take uh, this project leadership position. And I said, no. I'm not going to be involved in your false accusation. I don't want to be a part of it. And in fact, if you do it to them, you'll do it to me. Um, so we can't be so caught up in trying to um, get somebody um, um, convicted or, 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 or frame somebody that we started we start telling lies. A lying lip, the Bible says, is an abomination to the Lord. Amen. So um, we, we, we can't have a part of it. We, we should not have a part, should not partake in, in such a manner, matter. And if you think about it, these were people who were supposed to be religious. That's why it's not about religion. Amen. It's about a relationship with Jesus. Amen. Because if you have a relationship with Jesus, you know that the Bible tells us, like I said, lion lips are an abomination. Amen. So that's not something that God is pleased with. Amen. It's not about you. It's more about God. Amen. And so, um, they came up with this even worse um, charge or accusation that it was causing riot everywhere. Pilate could see through this, right? Because he was in charge of the area, in charge of keeping the peace. And so if Jesus was doing this, he certainly would have heard about it. Amen. And so um, one thing that stood out here was not necessarily stood out to, to, to um, Pilate. He heard that they say that he was from Galilee. And 
he took that as a uh, opportunity to send Jesus to the person who ruled over Galilee, and that was Herod. This is the same Herod that had um, John the Baptist killed, Herod Antipas. It's interesting here because, um, sorry, I'm, I'm a little behind here. Um, the Bible says that Herod was kind of delighted. He was excited to see Jesus because he had heard about all the miracles that he has done, and he wanted to actually see that himself. So he was delighted. He was ecstatic. He had heard so much about this mysterious, miraculous working man from Galilee. So his motivation here was simply just to see Jesus performing a miracle. There are, you know, people today that that's all they they're focusing on. Healing ministry and that's all their effort. And nothing is wrong with that. Amen. We know that 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 that, that Jesus gave us the power and the authority, amen, to, to work uh, miracles and stuff like that. Um but we can't be so caught up in that. Because seeing Jesus work in a miracle wasn't going to save him. In fact, the, the Bible ta- tells us, believe in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 18, that um, it's better to, 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 to um, go to, to heaven with not having your limbs than to be whole, right, and, and, and go to hell. So um, we can't be so caught up in miracles and not focus on salvation. Focus on what is required for us to be saved. Amen? And so when Jesus was brought before Herod, Herod began to question him. But Jesus never answered him. In all of the trial, he answered Pilate, he answered others, but here he remained silent. If you think about it, Herod didn't listen to John. He he had already made up his mind. He was cold. He was a cruel man. And his heart was hardened. There was really nothing that Jesus could say here that would change him. At this point, there was really nothing that Herod had to charge Jesus. And so the religious folks, they became desperate. Amen. Amen. And so they began to shout, the Bible says vehemently, their accusation, hoping that they would sway Herod and get their desired verdict. We see here that the Bible tells us that Herod and his soldiers, they began to mock Jesus. Um, you could say they were sarcastic in saying that, hey, you know, um, you're, 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 you're saying that you're the king. Um, they even clothed him, the Bible says, in a, in, a, in a robe. Amen. And they sent him again to Pilate. So Pilate thought he had um, gotten rid of his problem. But um, here again, Jesus is sent before him. So recall earlier, he said that he's innocent. He didn't find any fault. Right? Um, Herod apparently didn't see anything that he could... Um, charge Jesus with. So, in fact, so those are two occasions where Jesus should have been released. So here Jesus comes again t- before Pilate, and we see Pilate um, attempted to, to, to have Jesus released um, by telling his accuser that he found no fault with him a second time. And he backed up his conclusion by saying even Herod didn't find any fault with him. So um, he's not worthy of the death penalty. And he said, let's just flog him. Let's just give him a good beating and let him go, thinking that this would satisfy the people. But these people, they were in a frenzy. And they cried out, essentially saying that he must die. It was customary during this period for a prisoner to be released um, unto them. And um, they began to ask for Barus. And I find this very ironic because 
the charges that they were uh, meeting out to Jesus, Barabbas was guilty of them. He committed rebellion against a Roman. He was a murderer. So as I began to think about this, I was like, how should I put this? I wonder what was going on in their brain. It's, it's clear that they weren't thinking properly. Because if they were, then they would have realized that Barbas is the one that they should crucify. Because the, 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 the charges, he fit the crime, so to speak, not Jesus. So this man, Barbas, was guilty of the many accusations that they cast against Jesus. And like I said, he had even committed murder. So their actions had no logic. They just wanted Jesus to die. Like I said, Pilate wanted to release Jesus, and he, he had the authority to do so, but instead we see him arguing with the crowd to no avail. He tried a third time to let Jesus go. He didn't understand why they wanted Jesus to die so badly, because he had committed no crime. There is really no reason for him to be put to death. If you think about it, even when they condemned Jesus to die, there was no specific crime. There was no crime. But the crowd shouted louder and louder. And so Pilate sentenced Jesus to die. If you think about it, this was a leader who was more about his position than anything else. He didn't want to see a riot in Jerusalem because more than likely he would have lose his position. And so he gave in to the desire of the people. So he released Barbas and delivered Jesus unto them to do whatever they desire. I, I, was, I was just thinking that you know when, when the stakes get high sometimes it it may and can be difficult to stand up for what what is right. But as Christians, we ha we have to do what's right. We have to do what's pleasing in the eyes of the Lord. Irrespective of the stake. If Pilate had real courage, he would have simply released Jesus, no matter what the consequences were. I have a note here just, just saying that we are like Pilate. We know what is right, but decide not to do it. Don't let the Pilate spirit get on us. Let's do what is right. Let's do what's right at all times. So Jesus was led away from um, Pilate. to be crucified. Um, it, it was very typical for condemned um, prisoners to carry their cross on their own shoulders through the street of Jerusalem to the, excuse, to the execution site outside of the city. You know, maybe this was merely so that others could see. Um, it was, uh, it was, it was um, done so that um, others wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't try anything silly. Amen meaning that they would stay out of trouble, don't commit crime. And so Jesus started out, uh, but as you can imagine, with all the flogging and the beating that he, he had um, endured, that he was weakened. And um, a man by the name of Simon, we're told that he's a Cy Cyrenian, or uh, somewhere in North, North Africa, um, that he was coming to the city, maybe he was a simpler pilgrimage. And the soldiers um, had the authority to basically to coerce anyone to do as they say. And so they asked this, this stranger to carry the cross and, and um, to carry the cross. Amen. We see the Bible says that many followed him, including women. They were mourning. And Jesus told them not to weep. 
not to weep for him, but rather to be concerned about the impending destruction of Jerusalem. Weep for their children. Weep for um, the impending destruction that was to occur. Jesus was not the, the only one that was um, uh, crucified that day. Amen. So we, we understand that Barbas was released from prison. He had, in fact, committed sedition and murder. Um, but Jesus was given over to them. Um, and this was God's plan. Because if it was simply based on rules of laws, based on what was right, there would have been no reason for Jesus to be sentenced to death. Like I said, there was no specific charges that was um, true. But God's plan was in motion. He had to die to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Amen. The blood of goats, the blood of bullock could no longer. Um, as a matter of fact, it, 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 it didn't save anybody. It just pushed the sin a year ahead. And so this was God's plan to, to die for our sins. Amen. We see, uh, oh, sorry, let me, I, I thought it was kind of useful, uh, at least for me, just to, to in a synopsis, just, um, present to you the, 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 the trials because it was a series of, series of trials that Jesus faced. And so the first one was before Annas. He was the ex-high priest, but he was still considered powerful. Um, and As a matter of fact, maybe the, the, most of the Jews still recognize him as their high priest. Um, and so, so this was done um, so that, uh, because he, he probably has, he still had a lot of power, right? Um, right? This is who the Jews look up to. Um, there was also another um, trial before Cephas. He was, in fact, the ru ruling priest that the Romans had set up. And so they, this trial was essentially to gather evidence for the full high council hearing to follow. Then all of this stuff was legit illegitimate because it happens um, at night, which was against your law. Um, but in fact, he was found guilty during those, 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 those trials. The next one was before the high council or the Sanhedrin. This was really the formal, and I put here, religious trial and con condemnation to death. So what started out as a religious trial, right, um, then turned into a trial before Pilate, who was the highest Roman authority. And like I said before, all death sentences needed Roman approval. Again, the next, this was followed by a trial before Herod. He was a ruler of Galilee. And you could say this was um, Pilate trying to not take the blame. I want to share the blame. Um, and then the final trial was before Pilate. Um, we see, um, as I mentioned, there was many effort here that Pilate tried to, um, to not condemn Jesus because he was obviously innocent. We see now um, Jesus is brought to uh, Calvary. We should note here that um, Jesus wasn't the only one that was crucified that day. There were two thieves that were also led out to be crucified. This place, Calvary, was also called the place of skull. And it more than likely was a place that was used regularly for execution. It was located in a prominent area outside of the city, visible to the public, and probably um, uh, done uh, specifically so that people would see and experience this punishment and this would be an example or deterrent um, for criminal activity. 
all three were, were crucified there. Um, if you think about it, um, I, in my opinion, crucifixion was feared and a very shameful form of execution. It was designed to prolong the gruesome pain that a person would experience. It wasn't meant to be a short death. It's very typical that death would occur by sophistic, so, uh, suffocation, sorry. Um, because in order to breathe on the cross, somebody would literally have to kind of pull themselves up to be able to breathe. And so as they lose strength and weakness, they could no longer be able to do this. And so they would suffocate and die. It was probably one of the harshest form of capital punishment in the ancient world. Jesus didn't say a lot of words um, when he was on the cross. But one thing we, we see that he, he, he said in that state, facing horrible death, in pain, in agony, He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Can you imagine? We often don't want to forgive people for much less. Somebody look at you the wrong way and you're upset. You don't want to forgive them. Somebody may speak something falsely against you and come to you for forgiveness and but Jesus facing ridicule being mocked allowed to walk through the street half naked so to speak cuts on his back from the whipping. His hands nailed and feet nailed to the cross. And even in that state, he said, forgive them, Lord. They don't, they don't know what they're doing. It, it was customary for the Roman soldiers to divide up the clothing of the person being executed. And so we are told that they essentially gambled for Jesus' clothes. Even in the state, Jesus hanging on the cross, that wasn't enough for the religious leaders. They continued laughing, mocking, and scoffing. They said, save yourself. How can you save others? How can you perform miracles but cannot help yourself? If you're really the Christ, the chosen one of God, then show us. But they missed the fact that this was prophesied. This had to happen in order for him to save us all. I was very thoughtful in, in, in terms of thinking about this Roman soldier who was more or less in charge of conducting the execution. They typically had to stay until everything was done, until the person died. Um, they were mocking Jesus too, giving him vinegar, the Bible says. They also called on him to save himself if he were indeed the king of the Jews. We're told that a signboard was placed over his head. And it's very typical that the signboard would state the crime that the person committed. So let's see what the crime was. Um, 
what was written over him in the letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew, this is the king of the Jews. No crime. No crime. Absolutely no crime. Can, can you imagine? Somebody's on trial. And there's absolutely no evidence to convict him. Absolutely none. You'd expect this person to be released, to be freed. As I mentioned, Jesus wasn't the only one that was crucified that day. There were two thieves, one on his left, one on his right. One chose to <laughs> mock Jesus. Even in, in a state where he was about to die. I don't know what, what was there to be gained. You're in the same position, <laughs> hanging on a cross. I don't know what people do when they're facing death, but it's said that, you know, some people's life flash before them and they begin to think about the past. Maybe for this man it was too much. And <laughs> he, the only joy that he could find was to accuse Jesus. The Bible says that he railed at him saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other one rebuked him. He pretty much said, don't, don't, don't you fear God? You know, we are getting our just reward for what we've done. We committed a crime and we deserve this. But this man is not guilty. He's done nothing wrong. And he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Um, many people have looked at this scripture and they have talked about the fact that, see, you don't need to be baptized to be saved. You don't need the Holy Ghost to be saved. But we need to realize here that the law was still in existence. He hadn't, Jesus hadn't died. The Holy Ghost had not been poured out, right? We actually told that the Bible says in the book of Luke um, that repentance and remission of sins must be preached in his name beginning in Jerusalem. So that hasn't happened yet. So anybody who is trying to wait until they're on deathbed, you're taking a chance. <laughs> That's not the plan of salvation that God has given us in this time, in this day and age. Amen. So um, I know many, many have tried to use this to, to justify or, um, you know, their loved ones being saved when they have lived a life that was against God. They have, they, they have been opposed to God all their life. Um, So Jesus basically was placed on the cross um, about 9 a.m., so to speak, I believe, six hour. Did I get that right? And um, basically, at some point, darkness filled the entire place. So he was placed on the cross around 9 a.m., endured around three hours of excruciating pain, physical agony. But at noon, at midday, darkness fell across the land for three hours. It would seem as if all nature mourned this tragedy. This darkness was both a physical and spiritual darkness. The Bible tells us that the thick veil 
hanging in the temple, that it was torn apart. This veil or curtain essentially closed off or separated the most holy place from the holy place. If you recall, the temple had the outer courts or the courts for all the people. It has the holy place where only the priest could enter and then the most holy place where the high priest entered once a year to pay atonement for the sins of the people. Symbolically, this curtain or this barrier that separated a holy God from a sinful people was destroyed. God removed the barrier between himself and humanity. If you, if you recall, nobody could, could stand before the presence of the Lord. They would die. But with this touring of the veil, the Bible says that we can now come boldly before the throne of grace to make our petitions known. We can talk to Jesus directly. I know that there are some religion that feels that you have to go to the priest. No, we can go to Jesus directly. We can tell him all about our troubles. Amen. Hallelujah. And I'm so thankful. Amen. From then on, God no longer resides behind a curtain. But he wants to take up residence in our hearts and our minds if you let him. Amen. He wants to fill us with the Holy Ghost, that spirit of truth that will lead and guide us into all truth. Amen. I'm so thankful for the spirit of the Lord. Amen. And during this suffering, Jesus didn't faint. He didn't become unconscious. He didn't die the quote-unquote normal death that somebody who was crucified would endure. It appears that he was still very conscious. The Bible says that he cried with a loud voice and said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. That humanity, that flesh died. It struck me that a Roman soldier, the Bible says he was a centurion, who likely had seen many of crucifixion. This was probably not his first one, but there was something different. There was something unique. Maybe it's a thought that Jesus died from suffocation. Maybe it's hearing the words that Jesus said, forgiving those that had wrongly accused him and sentenced him to death. Maybe it was his cry. But he did something for this, this man. He said, surely, this was an innocent man, a righteous man. He understood that Jesus didn't deserve what he had received. Jesus had no sin. But he took upon himself the sins of this world. He paid the price for you and me. The Bible tells us that there was a once a wall of petition that separated us from God. We were far from the commonwealth of Israel. But Jesus had broken down that wall of petition. And we're no longer alien. We're no longer strangers. But we're building upon the foundations of the apostles and prophets with Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. Many left that day and went home in sorrow. There were the women that had followed and um, had observed from afar off what was happening. In all of this, uh, Joseph, who was a member of the um, Jewish council, amen, we're told that he didn't agree with the punishment that was meted out to Jesus. 
Um, the Bible says that he himself waited for the kingdom of God. Just to me, that indicate that he was a follower of Jesus. Um, he came and he asked for the body of Jesus, and he um, laid him in a tomb. I mean, if you recall, the um, Sabbath was fast approaching. This um, tomb was likely um, carved out of the limestone in the hills in that area. The, the women also followed so that they could see where Jesus was laid because they wanted to return and um, bring spices and ointment. This was kind of like somebody bringing flowers to a tomb um, to show their love, affection, appreciation for this person. You know, there's, there's not much that I, I can say um, about this crucifixion. It's just there for us to see and understand what Jesus endured the suffering that he endured, the shame that he endured because he wanted to reconcile us back to him. He wanted to give us life, to give us hope. That's why I cherish my walk with God so much. I couldn't buy my own freedom. None of us could. Jesus, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth on him, we know this belief is not just easy belief, believe isn't. You have to believe as the scripture had said. Amen. Bible said, should not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm so thankful for the cross. I'm thankful for the price that he paid for me. I am. Um, I'm going to end this morning by stating something I, I heard on, on Friday. went to a, a youth um, meeting. And the title of the message was, the rich man's mentality. Talking about Lazarus and the rich man. That the rich man had no concerns other than his. And it, it shocked me because there are so many people that are on the wrong path. But we can't get that mentality where we are not willing to tell others about Jesus. To share the salvation message which them. Because if we don't, essentially we're having that rich man mentality. Amen. So church, Jesus paid the price for the sins of the world. And there are many that are living in sin today. Many that need freedom. Many that are bound. We need to share this mess, salvation message. We need to tell somebody about the love of Jesus. Amen. God, we're so thankful today, God, for, for your word, God. Thank you, God, for the price that you paid, God, for our sins, God. We're truly grateful and thankful, God, for the sacrifice that you've made, God. God, we want to follow you, God. We want to live, God, righteous, holy, God. And tr God, in this time, God, help us, God, to be your hands, your mouthpiece, God. God, in our community, God, and share this good news of salvation, God, so that Others will be led to glorify you. Others will give their life to you. We give you thanks and praise Jesus. God bless God, the time of God, the food that we're about to partake of God. We give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, everyone say amen.